Welcome all to another great episode of What's Up Wednesday with your wonderful host, Roman Siobhan. And we're here at 321 Kiteboarding to talk to you about all of our wonderful weekly stuff that's been going on. So it's been a great windy week and that has gotten me started to think about something like organization. But before that, I must give a very, very big shout out for National Women's Day. Thank you very much for all the women in our lives, from our mothers to our coworkers to our girlfriends and wives. Um, and here's why they deserve a lot of credit every day, not just today, but you know what? We're gonna point it out today. One of the reasons is in kiteboarding, it's kind of a male dominated sport, but it's not because you know why? The women are the ones that are supporting us. Whether it's them pushing us on the water to be a better rider, riding with us, keeping us safer, or simply just supporting us, you know, on the side of the water, letting us go kiteboarding, helping us get our gear, um, you know, taking care of all the things that we obviously aren't when we're out kiteboarding. So to all the women, National Women's Day, if you haven't taken the day off already, do it now. Okay. Not you, Melanie. <laughs> but anyway, on to uh, our wonderful Wednesday ruminations. So uh, one of the things that I wanted to point out, we were uh, organizing things all week, and one of the things that happens when we're kiteboarding is there's a lot going on. So we've always had a really good checklist of things to bring with us, of course, and things to bring back, more importantly. So if you don't have one of those, maybe you're new to kiteboarding and, and all the gear is kind of you know, uh, it's making your head spin, Make a little checklist, laminate it, sticking on your dash, you know, right in front of your speedometer or something like that. You know, remember your kite, remember your bar, remember your harness, remember your wetsuit, your booties, that kind of thing, and your board. Don't forget the board. Um, it'll keep you from misplacing gear, having to go back and get it, or having it turned into us and us having to say, hey, lost and found, come and get your stuff, which we do, by the way, just in case you didn't know. Um, one of the other things is organization when it comes to doing small things like downwinders. Um, there's a really great uh, blog that I wrote about doing downwinders here in Cocoa Beach, and it'll be down there in the link uh, on YouTube. But um, it's really easy to do a downwinder here. You can literally go from 13th Street all the way up to Cherry Down or vice versa, and it's about seven miles. It's a great downwinder. You just have to know where to go, how to catch the bus. Um, and if you've never done it before, the good news is Cocoa Beach has some really great street markers right on the crossways over to the beach into the highway. So you can just get out of the water, walk up with your kite, see what street you're on, and uh, find a bus stop from there. So if you ever need help with that, give us a call here at the shop, or again, read that great blog that's down there in the link. Um, one of the other things is really just kind of um, making a checklist uh, when you are doing your downwinder as well, because there's some simple things that you need to remember. Normally, if you're not taking the bus, you're dropping off a car, the person who leaves the car down there, you really need to make sure that they remember to bring their key with them or don't leave it in the, the ride vehicle because that really stinks. When you get to your destination, you realize the person who's supposed to be driving you back has their key in your car. Um, also, we typically leave one of our cell phones in the drop-off car. That way, if something did happen or you're running late, when you get back to your location downwind, you can hop in the car, make a phone call instead of everybody's phone being at the uh, destination point when you started. So that's enough about organization. One of the things that really, really, really has sprung up in the, the recent history of kiteboarding is foil boarding, hydrofoil boarding. I know everybody's seen it. If you've been thinking about getting into it, but been a little timid, um, you know, it's an awesome, awesome aspect of the sport. It's not easy. It's like learning all over again, which could be fun or frustrating. So I highly recommend borrowing someone's board or coming down and renting one, um, taking a lesson, something like that, just to see if it's something that you might want to pursue because the gear for it is not inexpensive. Um, today, I've got a couple of different uh, items with me. We're gonna go over what foil to pick, why to pick it. Uh, I'm not gonna get into brands as much because every brand is coming out with a different foil, it seems like, every week. So, um, you know, if you have a favorite brand and they, they have a foil, go ahead, grab that one. If not, there's a bazillion to choose from. We do recommend a nice strong build and something fairly light. You don't want all aluminum or steel or whatever. It just makes for a very heavy foil and the danger factor is a little bit higher than just with your standard twin tip. So let's get started with what type of foil should I buy? I'm gonna make this really quick, I promise. So the three types of foils are very simple. You have a high aspect ratio. That means it's very, very thin. 
One of those would be something like this LP foil. LP has a nice, high performance, really high aspect, not super high, but pretty high aspect wing. That is gonna do a couple of things. Let me put that down, all right. So the first thing that's gonna do is that's gonna give you a higher top speed. It's gonna be more efficient as far as its speed goes and it's released through the air. So if you're looking at jumping, higher aspect foils are typically what most people prefer. One of the other things it's going to be good at is racing. So if you really need to point up wind and you really need to go fast, that is gonna be good for you. The downfalls of a high aspect foil are that they don't have a lot of initial lift. So you have to get going faster. And if you're new to the sport, that means you're really gonna to have to balance that foil before it gets on a nice good plane. And it may not be the easiest one for you to ride. So we don't recommend that brand new people look at high aspect foils for their first foil. That brings us to a mid aspect foil. Mid aspect foils are becoming more and more popular, like this F1 model. This is a mid aspect foil. It's uh, not high, not low, and this is a really great uh, construction. This one has just one through bolt, so it's really easy to take apart. You just take one tool, unscrew this rod, rod comes out, foil comes apart, goes in your car. But mid aspect foils are gonna give you kind of the best of both worlds. They are going to give you Really good initial lift, so it's easier to get up on the board, but it's still gonna give you some good high end speed. So it's gonna grow with you a lot more. The learning curve is a little steeper than with a low aspect foil, but you're probably gonna be rewarded with a, a foil that's gonna last a lot longer so you don't have to replace it with anything else. You're gonna be able to race with it, jump with it, um, just ride back and forth. It's gonna be good in light winds, it's gonna be good in moderate to high winds as well. So that's a mid aspect foil. Now, low aspect foils have been going away because they're building them better and better. Um, here is a slingshot foil. Um, it's a little bit heavier than a lot of the other ones, but it's a great entry level foil. And this one, again, is almost a mid aspect, not necessarily a low aspect. Low aspect foils would be like some of the older MHL lifts where they're very round looking, almost like a big shovel. Those are gonna really get you up on plane a lot faster, uh, but they don't have a good top end and they tend to be a little bouncy because they've got so much lift that you're gonna come up off the water quickly and you'll hear people talk about that porpoising effect. What are, good, or what are low aspect ratio foils good for? They're good for when you're starting. They're gonna get you up out of the water. They're gonna get you on plane a lot faster. They're good for light wind riding. If you don't plan on going really, really fast, they're very good for that. They don't jump as well, but they're still good jumping foils if you need one. So that's the foil. As far as boards are concerned, for your first board, we highly recommend something a little bit bigger with a little bit more volume in it. That way you're able to get on plane or work the foil before it comes up. When you become more experienced and you don't ever really touch the water, some of these small boards like the LP or the uh, Dwarf Craft or um, the Zico Pocket, you know, some of those are gonna be really good um, because they're small, they're easy to move around and they're way easier to transport. But that's foils in a nutshell. If you have any questions whatsoever, just give us a call. Uh, we're more than happy to answer just about any questions. If you like our What's Up Wednesday, give us some thumbs up. Subscribe to whatever it is that you're watching this on right now, if it be YouTube or Facebook or Instagram, um, or if you're just right here in the shop. You can come down any Wednesday right around five o'clock and you can be on the show too. I don't know if you wanna be, but you can. All right guys, thank you very much. Happy Woman's Day. Thank you for joining me on another episode of What's Up Wednesday. I'm gonna hit the end button now, like finish. So thumbs it. Thanks, Eduardo. Ha <laughs> ha.